there, a mentor, um, a concerned community member, and the director of Northwest Credible Messenger, right? A little bit of the history around Northwest Credible Messenger. Um, you can see our mission right there. We are, um, <laughs> bam, there's our mission. I'm not going to read it. I'll let you read it. But we're an organization that's uh, that came to be in 2016, really just laser focused on um, the development of the next generation of black and brown communities. We are intensely focused on capacity building because we do believe that there are a lot of people who are credible um, and peers, right? Who are able to do the work, but oftentimes they just do not get the microphone. So we're in the business of amplifying those voices, providing support to organizations. Um, oftentimes we start with community leaders, wrap them in support, help them develop their processes, whether it's business or 501c3, um, you know, and connect them to all of the things that they need to be successful. Uh, a lot of the work that we do is around curriculum development, but as you see, we'll continue to move forward and you'll see um, a lot more of the things that we are doing. Um, one of our amazing project managers is on the call and I'm going to let her introduce herself. Hi, I am Kalia Williams O'Neill. I am a project manager and support specialist at Northwest Credible Messenger. I'm also 24 years old as of last month. And um, yeah, it has been great to really nurture my leadership through this process in working with Northwest Credible Messenger and our many consortium partners. So just getting going. Oh, S C R Y, superintendent of the next generation. Um, so just a little bit of history, right? Just before we get going, um, you know, we we really want to tie into those topics um, that Amanda had shared with us. So we're going to get into that, but a little bit of history around what we do, and at the end, we'll make time for some Q and A. Um, and we're really looking for an opportunity to be able to do this again, so we could talk a little more broader about what we do as an organization and a consortium as a whole. Um, in 2016, there was um, a series of juvenile homicides in South King County. And at that point in time, um, I, working with, as a project manager for King County Superior Court, um, I will say, you know, which was a huge accomplishment being that that was, you know, a court that had actually sent me to be a resident in one of their systems before, um, had the opportunity to lead a process that was focused on having a community-based and driven response to that, to that violence. Um, we started to develop a process which ended up turning into an organization called the Federal Way Youth Action Team. Um, and as you see, while that wasn't the organization that we were looking for to stop what was happening in our communities, um, we realized that it had a huge impact on young people who were facing adversity or were on the margins of their education. Um, so, you know, we didn't want to burn down one house because it didn't do what we wanted it to do because it had an unintended outcome that was amazing. So we focused on you know, building pathways for um, young people who are on their way to prison or the graveyard to have that support from peer types. 2017, um, I had an opportunity to work with a national network through um, CM3, the Credible Messenger Mentoring Movement in Washington, D.C., and took the opportunity to begin training with them. Um, and, oops, I'm sorry, trying to get that chat to stop popping up on me um to start training with them and then working with an organization in the south bronx between dc and bringing a community of providers with lived experience to be a part of that training 2018 I had the opportunity to work with the national network to become a train the trainer um, and through that process had a great opportunity to come back to our state and implement this work that we're doing now as northwest credible messenger super amazing process we ended up training a bunch of organizations that were really um interested in doing the work. And in 2019, because we seen a profound effect on the young people that we were working with, um, but not just the young people that we were working with, the leaders that we were hiring, training and mentoring to do the work, we had a shift. And that shift was strategically around building capacity for these organizations. That's when we started really being laser focused on development of these organizations. And then since 2019, we have supported the development of 11 501c3s, connecting them to millions of dollars. 2020 had a gang intervention focus. Uh, at that point in time, we began contracting statewide with the Department of Children, Youth, and Families and developing a roadmap for gang intervention in our state. Um, 
the things that we learned through that process were that healing is imperative, right? That reflection, that uh, mirror work is imperative in what we were trying to our, uh, effectuate in our communities um, and really just kind of leaned into what it looked like to embrace healing-centered engagement as a strategic part of the model that we were developing. 2021, we enhanced the support and development of our um, contracted partners. And since the beginning of that contract, we've been able to support the development of six different 501c3s, connecting them to contracts and supporting them through this process. Here we are in 2022, right? Expanding our impact in behavioral health consortium. And the reason why behavioral health is important to us is because naturally credible messenger is a peer-based model. Um, we do see value in having it recognized as a peer-based model, but the behavioral health tools that some of the community need, leaders in these projects needed, we realized weren't present. So we've been laser focused on what it looks like to support them in training. We've been sponsoring them in healing centered practitioner certification through the Flourish Agenda and working with HCA to um, have these groups uh, become certified peer counselors, as well as supporting HCA with um, the distribution of a BIPOC seed fund. Okay. This is one of the amazing things that grew out of our project, and I am going to let Kalia share about this. Yeah, so like I mentioned, I am one of the project managers at Northwest Credible Messenger. This is the very first project I work on with North Northwest Credible Messengers. It is my little baby. I love it so much and can go on and on for the entirety of this <laughs> Zoom, but I will not. Uh, it is called the Healthy Masculinity Curriculum, combat, and it is all, and it is, it was developed to combat the rise of intimate partner violence during the pandemic. Um, it is a behavioral health curriculum-based um, program that was in partnership with um, behavioral health specialists, as well as really getting youth voices added into this. We did a number of I constantly forget this word, focus groups. We did a number of focus groups with youth to get their opinion throughout the process on what issues were important to them and what where they found pressures in their life when it came to the image of masculinity. Because we all know about toxic masculinity that is like a trigger that is like everywhere now, but let's talk about healthy masculinity because overall it impacts everyone. Um, you see here just four of our 20 curriculums that we developed over the course of a couple of months. So we have mental health in youth, emotions and masculinity, emotions and masculinity. I feel like I said that word, important, the importance of community and adolescent brain development. Um, there are a number of ones, including some pop culture ones and just the impact of um, socialization and other things that we have developed throughout the course of those 20 curriculums and we just yeah it just it's very important to me because like I said masculinity impacts everyone I from girls being told that they cry too much to boys not being allowed to cry at all and just delving on to how can instead of just throwing away somebody who may have been impacted by domestic violence both from the um uh, those impacted through action and those that may have done it themselves, let's actually get to the root cause of what is causing this and help our communities to no longer be impacted by such violence. We also have um, our politicizing our youth campaign. So we do have some project examples. Um, the politicizing our youth campaign is again, youth voice led and really um, empowering that advocacy and um, campaigning when it comes to legislation. Um, and it's also a huge project for us that honestly is one of my favorites again, because it's just more fun to hear, um, to empower those youth voices and see that passion behind their eyes. So please let me know if my screen did change for you all. Yes, it looks great. All right. Uh, Janie, we can share this slide in the email as well. So we will um, share with Amanda this first. Jason, I heard you speaking in the video and, and in the oh. thing. Did you say something? 
Yeah, your, your sound for the video isn't on. But so looking at these processes, right, and these different projects that Aaliyah is sharing, for us, it was, you know, when you really think about positive youth development, it was one, creating a safe space for young people to feel welcome, attaching and belonging. Um, and through that process, we really like leaned into the learning and doing like, what did it look like for us to invest in the experiential leadership in various areas of their lives, right? So thinking of relationships being one, and this one was dope. We were able to actually put together a panel of um, folks who were working towards becoming either school board, um, school district, board members, or city council members from various areas that we had programming in around King County. And this was a project that was completely led by young people, right? But getting back to the learning and doing, like we really thought about what would it look like to develop relationships with young people so strong that we could get them to do different things. Um, and it started out with one of our gang intervention groups in 2018. We, um, looking at, uh, let me see, in the examples on the slide, it was number six. Working with the group of gang-involved kids in federal way, we got them to this process. They actually worked on translation, transition legislation rules with DCYF um, that we didn't even know at that point in time actually led to us being a sole source contract provider for our statewide gang intervention project. Um, the, the information that DCYF shared with us was the work that's happening with these young people, some of which we know from being previous residents in our system, it's powerful. And if you could get these young people to be so informed on policy, we wonder what you could, what else you could get them to do. So for us, it was the learning and doing, the experiential leadership, really strategically focusing on those relationships that produced the, you know, safety for young people. But we started leaning into reconnecting them to their community. What did it look like to have meaningful relationships in their community? Um, overall health and wellness. That was the, the behavioral health, the mental health component, right? Like we started teaching curriculums in ways that we wanted these young people to know that it was cool to talk about your behavioral health. It was cool to talk about the things that you were struggling with, um, with mental health. Uh, and, and expanding that, right? Work, education, um, and creativity, right? Like in innovation, we really needed to make this fun. So it was like, what did these young people really want to be involved in? Um, and it led to us doing projects like right now. Um, we're about to start a supportive reentry youth screen printing company, right? That's you know, led by young people. Um, so thinking of innovation, we've always thought outside the box. It, you can see some of the previous examples that we led and working with young people in various areas on policy around the state. Um, this year, we will be working on a proviso with Representative Simmons that is related to behavioral health and supporting young people in various regions around the state. So politicizing our youth is huge. Um, through the relationships that we have, we really wanna give these young people the mic, um, the training, the skills, the leadership opportunities to be able to use their voice in a way that impacts their community. So today, um, some of the outcomes were how we identify and apply strengths-based language changes, right? And if you know, um, the power of language, then you know the way that you say things is very impactful, especially to the participants that you work with. But taking it a step further, it's even important to the way that we communicate with each other, right? Um, so teaching our program participants to roll up resistance and change through healing-centered engagement. The reason why we use healing-centered engagement is right here. You wanna talk about this, Kalia? Yes, so Healing Centered Engagement is founded on the, the five karma principles, culture, agency, relationships, meaning, and aspirations, and that impact it has on everyone. Um, one thing about Healing Centered Engagement, we found as we went through the training ourselves and really embedded this in our work was that not only is it working to heal the youth, but it's also healing the facilitators and the leaders in our groups, helping the community um, leaders as well. It is a strength-based communication for us, um, has been rooted in how we motivate our youth to see a brighter perspective on their life and tools we utilize for healing-centered engagement. Not often do youth or anyone experiencing um, a persistent stress environment get to talk about their lack of agency and how that's impacted their ability to aspire to higher things or understand what where they find meaning in life. And so we 
really tackle that in all of our curriculums now and all of our programs to open those discussions and it's really foundational in the way that we do our work because we found that it is healing for all and that is the work that we do. We want to heal our community and support our communities in all ways. Um, through these karma principles, it is the most mirror moments, most reflective moments for all involved in the process. So you guys seen in the earlier slide that we were talking lastly, right? But you know, last but not least, um, aspiration. Uh, so we understand that the ability to hope, dream, imagine, and then manifest what we wanna see um, around in our work is a very powerful tool in our overall development. Um, but people, right? Not just our participants, us as well. We need the freedom to first dream and then focus, right? To set and work towards whatever those goals are. And the framework for all of this starts in the way that we communicate. You can speak life into a goal. You can speak life into participants. You can speak life into your coworkers, the partners in the work that you're doing. Um, and we do believe that that strengths-based communication is really important. Um, what's, really, what's really imperative right here is like, just looking at the slide, right? So those of you who do this work may understand frenzy. It's like, it never ends, right? The demands, constantly fast-paced. Sometimes we're in that crisis mode. We're just trying to get a W, right? Um, the reality is uh, losses sometimes are lessons. So when we're focused on the problems in front of us, we can't even find the time or where to begin thinking of how work and life can be different. This is the way that aspiration works for us, right? Because we, we become overwhelmed responding to problems or keeping up with these things. It's hard for us to imagine through aspiration, right? We can speak to people in a way that will help them to think differently. Um, let's go to the next one. So for the sake of time, we, we didn't do a presentation the way that we traditionally do, but we do wanna just give this information and then make time for Q and A. So we're gonna, we're gonna move through these. Um, but does this sound familiar, right? If the trauma and stress environments in our lives have caused us to be anxious, fearful, or it's robbed of us of our ability to focus our dream, then an important part of healing has to be engaging our creativity. We talked about creativity and innovation earlier and exercising our minds to think differently. We know that brains are malleable. Um, we frequently use a video around the backwards brain bicycle. You got time after this, Google it on, um, or Google it for YouTube. It's, it's a really powerful video to use in workshops and presentations, the backwards brain bicycle. It talks about how our brains are super malleable and this is what we wanna teach young people, right? Not only teaching them, giving them visuals, so we're multi-sensory. We're teaching them how to change through the language that we use with them and the materials that we facilitate during our groups. This is the way that we approach behavior. Um, so when we say differently, um, we mean strengths-based, right? And shifting to thinking about aspirations. Um, Want to get this one, Clea? Yes. Okay. Sorry, my notes turned off. All right. So the HCA is working on a definition of aspirations as the capacity just, or sorry, the HCA's working definition of aspiration is the capacity to see beyond the present condition and imagine a possible desired future. Aspirations are field are the field that motivate us, provide purpose and a direction in our lives. Be mindful that aspiration thinking is not only for participants, but us as well. Aspirations are not goals. There is a difference. Goals are tactical. Uh, you know, it's like my goal is to graduate. Love that for you. Why? What are you? What are you going to school for? Why do you want to graduate? And moving beyond just the tangible things, it's more feeling space, right? And what it means to you, for you, like what the aspirations' purpose are, how the aspirations create a purpose in you. Rather, sorry, um, they have a specific objective and some type of measurable outcome. Aspirations, however, are inspirational aspirations include an in, an imagined future something that doesn't exist yet and is wide open with infinite possibilities aspirations can be used to, sorry to motivate us towards a goal but they are not goals sorry i keep having so this is one that we just want to all right if somebody wants to read it out loud please volunteer volunteer yourself
This is Amanda. I'll read it out loud. Thank you. If Amanda. you'd like. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully it doesn't drop me. <laughs> um, I'm going to keep my um, my cam off though because I seem to have better luck that way. Um, having dreams and inspirations are powerful tools in our behavioral health journey to well-being. Aspirations convey the idea that we don't have to accept the current conditions. In our work as credible messengers, we utilize history a lot to convey how we lead in the present. Think about the examples of labor, <clears throat> of labor leaders, Cesar Chavez and Doris Huerta, Rosa Parks, and the civil rights movement in general. Harriet Tubman, or if those don't seem familiar, what about Apple Incorporated? What do they have in common? They are all focused on what is possible, not what currently exists. That's aspirational thinking. And if we think it's enough, we and if we think it enough, we believe it. We speak it and we change our framework and language to strength-based aspirational language. So in your emojis, if you agree, can you get a thumbs up? Let's go to the next slide. Okay, I'm sorry, y'all. You, you want someone to read? <laughs> you sound like you're ready, Kelly. Come I'll on. read. Aspirational thinking also contributes to our well being and helps us imagine new solutions to problems. We know from research that when we begin to think about a possible future, the thinking process cultivates optimism and hope. Together, these are important mindsets optimism and hope that can protect against depression, anxiety, and uncertainty. Powerful, right? Aspirational thinking turns into speaking, believing, doing, and creates shifts, right? It can support us with depression, anxiety, uncertainty, all of those things that, you know, we as leaders, not just our participants, struggle with. Um, you're right, Amanda, language has power. So thinking about this, um, let's dig a little bit deeper. So one of the barriers to aspirational thinking is the way in which we think and the words we use when discussing possibilities and opportunities. This is powerful, right? Oftentimes we may use closed language, not really thinking that, oh wait, words make a difference. So let's look at some of those examples. How many times have we heard these, right? Thinking of these closed words, they have meaning, right? They convey value, resist, defend, disrupt, demand, fight, struggle, convey, destroy, deconstruct. Do you hear any possibility there? Like this is not possibility thinking. Next slide, right? So thinking of these open words, right? They can generate things, right? Closed words are important and necessary to create fairness and justice, but they're not really about, um, they're, they're really all about eliminating the movement. When we're thinking aspirational thinking, we're talking about the power of possibility, right? Contained within the words we are using is the indication of what we value. And if we're talking about aspiration and possibility, then we really have to speak it in the way, right? For example, I just wanna give a point of clarity. We don't have a position in this. It's just an example. Um, yes, there's power in unity. That is our mantra, come on. Um, during the pandemic, we seen the statement um, defund the police utilize. How many people seen that? Right? I'm just going to assume a lot of people are saying they have because I can only see a handful of you. Um, but are we really thinking about what that looks like? Right? And the question I have is did it work? Um, and what's the solution to the values behind that statement? Just think like, what if we said create or develop or reimagine more opportunities for fill in the blank? Now, people who use that statement they understand what the blank was, right? Once again, we don't have a position in this. We're just using it as an example because it's something recent that we can all look to. Do you see the difference in what I'm saying, right? Instead of saying defund the police, what if those people who use the statement said, let's create fill in the blank. Let's develop together fill in the blank. Let's reimagine fill in the blank. Gives the power of possibility. So, Kalia, you want to take this one? Yes. 
So you've probably heard about survival mode. Um, and if you haven't, you've probably experienced it. It is very common, especially it's a traumatic response to whatever you're going through. It's a trauma response, right? So um, can, um, another barrier to aspirational thinking is the limited outlook created by limited opportunities and vision, the results of resisting oppression, which is an act of pushing up against something so large it is that it forces you to re remain in survival mode. Anytime we, we are, are oppressed or facing resistance, it is hard to formulate the words we need. So again, we utilize aspirational thinking to empower ourselves and participants to roll with resistance and stay in the moment focused on change and hope. Survival mode, like I said, it is extremely common. It is a trauma response. And much like other trauma responses, you are not supposed to be in it for an extended period of time. And yet many of the people we work with and many of the people doing this work have experienced it for an extended period of time. And it's about figuring out how to move away from survival mode and just simply start to live more. Um, the stress that this again causes any trauma response causes on you for a prolonged period of time that in that creates more stress that changes your brain development and especially when working with youth it is important to understand that because youth are already our minds are already still developing I according to research I got one more year of my brain still going through these extremely um vast processes and it's important that we acknowledge that acknowledge and work with youth and those doing the work again to move away from the survival mode and think more towards aspirational language and aspirational thinking. All those that we work with and all those doing this work have demonstrated resilience throughout their lives. The very fact that they've made it here or are making the or are doing the work show uh -huh. that they have been resilient in the environment that they maybe grew up in or are currently experiencing. And so we want to work on how that resilience that they demonstrate during survival mode can be applicable to aspirations and aspirational thinking. Like always, and has been stated in the chat, language matters. It is extremely important. So a couple of quotes that we thought of when we were thinking of the way that we use this framework. Um, sometimes the condition of, da of daily, daily, Sorry. Sometimes the conditions of daily life, of everyday oppressions, of survival, render, render much of our imagination in there. We're constantly putting out fires, responding to emergencies, and finding temporary refuge, all of which make it difficult to see anything other than the present. Um, the frenzy of our activism neutralizes our work for peace. It destroys our own inner capacity for peace, and it destroys the fruitfulness of our own work because it kills the root of inner wisdom, which makes our work fruitful. Um, so oppression's greatest casualty is our inability to see beyond, right? Um, our, our participants face this in various areas of every one of our lives we face this. As a result, we're limited in our ability to dream, imagine, or even speak, right? Talking about the power of language to a different reality. Um, however, instead, when we begin to reimagine the rules of society with uh, a new way of living our lives, we can redefine our relationships with oppression. That's the power of aspiration. I think. That's the message that we're trying to articulate today, right? Seeing beyond the present to endless possibility. And we do believe that it starts with the power of language. So what we wanted to do, right, as a new and emerging organization, We've been on the scene since 2016. Behavioral health is definitely something that we're invested in, um, we're growing in. Uh, one of our aspirational goals as an organization is to have the credible messenger model recognized as a peer-based model. We are the Washington State Ambassadors of a national movement. So um, there's a lot of working pieces to what we do. Um, we currently operate programming in supportive reentry which is strategically focused on developing those relationships that produce results in the lives of the participants that we're working with. We focus on business innovation. We just talked about how we're developing a screen printing company that's going to be led, owned, and ran by young people. Um, so in January, if you have any screen printing needs, please let us know because we know some young folks who would definitely love to put in some work for you. Um, healthy masculinity, and we have a partnership with the Institute for Innovation and Prosecution. And I just wanna say this, right? 
Investing in the next generation of black and brown leaders is so powerful. This is the reason why we got behind HCA and the work around the BIPOC seed grant. Kalia started working with us when she was 22 years old. She led this process to develop healthy masculinity curriculum in a national transform, transformational prosecutorial organization, the Institute for Innovation and Prosecution used that program, those curriculums to share with 17 jurisdictions nationally in their Beyond Big Cities uh, program. So if you go to the Institute for Innovation and Prosecution, Beyond Big Cities paper series, if you look at the restorative justice white paper and you look at the intimate partner violence white paper, you'll see our contributions to those overarching projects um, in 17 jurisdictions nationally. Um, so I just wanna champion and applaud Kalia and give her her roses while she's with us because she is going to move on to great things, right? Um, because she too has aspirations to become a lawyer. So she's going to be a phenomenal lawyer at one point in the near future. Um, thinking of beyond that and the other things, we have a statewide gang intervention process. We have our politicizing our youth campaign, which this year we're expanding statewide. So we will be working with partners in different regions around the state to do this. Um, and, um, you know, just the healing centered engagement processes. We are the only licensed organization in the Northwest to certify folks as credible messengers. Um, we've been doing a lot of different work in regions around the state, Bremerton, um, Skagit County, so Kitsap County, Skagit County, Pierce County, King County, Yakima, Spokane counties, um, and definitely looking forward to seeing what, it, what does it really look like for us to build connection and relationships to a lot of you who are doing this work in peer um, spaces in your communities. So we wanted to make sure that we had time for Q&A, um, some of you are like, who is Northwest Credible Messenger? And I think now's the time to really be able to respond to that. Thank you, Jenny. I appreciate that. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I'm going through the chat now. It was like 50 things the whole time. I was like, I'm here. <laughs> Bianca, that was a powerful point. Yes. It's amazing what aspiration can do, right? The way that you deliver, the way that you frame, right? Can speak life into something, can speak life into people, right? Not just people, movements. If you think of like, the reason why we talk about movements in the history of our work is because if you think about a lot of the movements that have been really transformative in BIPOC communities over the years, they've been led by young people, right? You've been led by young people, right? Who have the power of aspirational thinking to be able to make some of the changes that we see in our communities today. We can't wait to be at that PEP conference either. We got some really cool stuff planned. Mike has his hand raised, Jason. If you're oh. ready to start taking questions. Yes, I apologize, Lamont. I was looking at the chat. No worries. Uh, I, I was just with the chat and I was going to say that even with this aspirational uh, thinking, speaking, recovery language, whatever you want to call it, uh, one, of, one of the things that I've come up with that I tell uh, people when we're thinking about word choices and what we're saying is that uh, while Webster will give words definition, we all give it individual meaning. And that's why these word choices are so important because you know that that communication model you seeing other people there's all that filter and then receiving translation so uh the definition is one thing but meaning is a whole lot something different yes that was powerful thank you Lamont. So those of you who have sent me direct messages in the chat, I did post my email and Kalia's email just for the sake of time and being present. Please send us an email and we'll definitely follow up to those as soon as possible. 
So thoughts, questions, comments. Amy, I see your hand. Yes, so this isn't a question. I just wanna let you guys know how well you did. Like this, this is a new perspective. Um, and I'm really excited to be able to go out and teach people by what I just learned. Um, I What I do when I come to uh, presentations is I come in and soak up as much as I can and um, just be so impressed. Um, I can't believe I haven't heard of you guys sooner because this is this is great work that you are doing. And I'm just grateful that you guys came in and shared it with us today. Thank you. Thank we are you. so thankful to be invited. Thank you, HCA, for having us. Uh, Bianca. Yeah, I just want to say thank you all for being here. I'm glad I was able to make this meeting and and it just it makes sense that it was this timing. Um, but I just want to say uh, as somebody who works within an organization um, and I have seen and fought for a position with a fellow coworker, we are two uh, Latinos fighting to shift how we do this strengths-based approach in peer work. Mm -hmm. um, we work with youth in the community across Pierce County. I work within King County also. And what we know from our community and our heritage and how we, like this is, this kind of healing is our medicine. This is what we know. Yes. And so it's aspire, it's inspiring and aspiring to see it kind of move through community and different organizations. And I'm just super, like I'm always pumped for peer support work and healing within our communities, but I'm really excited to figure out how to connect with you all and how do we uh, bring this work further to the clinicians, to the other people that we've been doing within our own peer support work, trying to shift. I think um, the way you're helping support clinicians, behavioral health technicians, all of them learn. There's a different way in that, you know, sometimes hearing them tell youth like, you know, do you have hope? That feels sometimes so stagnant, but to think about it in a different way of aspiring, that feels like there's movement. And mm. um, to have more people out there focusing on that messaging, especially for our incarcerated youth or youth at risk, um, it's it's powerful. And so I just want to say thank you. I can't wait to connect. Um, yeah, just thank you all for being here. We're definitely excited about the possibilities. Um, we currently are working on um, some stuff with the Pierce County Council. So hopefully we'll be in your community real soon. Kelly, you were super excited to share earlier. Tell us a little bit about your work, please. You're on mute, brother. So my name is Kelly. I work with Nisqually Indian Tribe. I just want to, you know, thank you uh, for the presentation. This is still new. I'm a SUDP uh, counselor. I've uh, been in the field about 10 years. I worked with ABHS, working with DOC population for about four or five years. Then I went to Nisqually Indian Tribe, worked there for three years, built the program, and then went out to Squaxin Island and worked inpatient with Northwest Indian Treatment Center. Now I'm back with Nisqually again, and we are looking at building a peer support program, an outreach program mm -hmm. here because of all the fentanyl, the overdoses. And so uh, I'm trying to take in as much information as I can to get this program up and going. I'm looking at, you know, building a train the trainers for peer support, recovery coaching, things like that. So this is still fairly new. Um, and I'm also in school at Evergreen State College. I'm in the Native Pathways program. So mm -hmm. I appreciate all your work and I'm hearing some resources. I'm all about <clears throat> resources. I, I feel the more resources we have, the more successful we'll be. So I always try to take in as much information I can to spread the knowledge out in the community. Um, that way we give an opportunity for the individuals uh, to have resources to succeed. So I appreciate it. I'm hearing some good things. I got a couple of people I work with right now that would like to get into screen printing and that kind of just I'm like, huh, it's all about, it's all about timing. I, you know, I feel so yes, uh, yes, yes. I definitely appreciate it. I uh, emailed Shelly about train the trainers. So it, like I said, this is a new program and I'm excited to get it up and going. Cool. You know, I, I believe what you said, um, right. Everything is, is almost in alignment. 
So uh, a year ago, I moved to Thurston County. Um, recently, I was appointed to a three-year term as a racial equity and inclusion council member for Thurston County. Um, and I'm assuming this quality is in Thurston County. So thinking of this, there's a huge focus that we have on supporting Thurston County communities. Now granted, I've lived in King County for 20 years of the time that I've been in Washington, offices in King County, but we do have a statewide process and Thurston County is one of the areas that we're trying to impact. So I am going to put my email in the chat and I would love to connect with you when you have a great connection, but. Awesome, appreciate you, thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, temperature check, thermometer, where are we at? Okay, okay. This is doing great. Um, you guys are doing wonderful. I'm so excited that you're able to share all of this wonderful information. If you had to pick like three top things to share for resources right now, what would they be, Jason, for um, to continue with your movement forward? Uh, to continue with our movement forward, one, we do offer training. So like I shared, we are the only organization in this region um, licensed to certify credible messengers, right, which is a peer-based model. So we'd love to connect with folks around those trainings. If you feel like this is something that would be beneficial for your organizations, we would love to do that. We are a statewide organization, so we are building capacity in regions around the state. We would love to make connections with you all about how you can connect with different uh, credible messenger organizations in your regions, right? Our goal is to be able to share these tools. And sometimes, right, it's through proximity. We always say there's power in unity, but the reality is we really believe that relationships produce results. We talked about positive youth justice, attaching and belonging. That's relationship-based, right? Um, through developing a relationship with HCA, we were able to present today. Um, and we're hoping that we can strengthen relationships with the organizations that are a part of this meeting um, and really start to expand the work that we're doing in the peer group. Um, I think the third thing is just reaching out, right? Like curiosity. Um, us being a part of the whole BIPOC seed grant process with HCA um, was really rooted in us having strength in relationships around the state. But I think one of the things when we're thinking about equity is, right, relationships, right, are really imperative for cultural competency. Um, and I think, you know, we're talking about cultures and, and subcultures and ways of being. And the more time that you make um, to spend with others, the more that you're learning about the way that people operate culturally. Healing centered engagement, right? You think of that karma acronym. Culture was the very first one, right? We don't believe that, or we do believe that um, you can't teach what you don't know, right? And knowing yourself is extremely imperative to what we do. And I think that's that first uh, piece of the acronym, karma, culture, right? So we'd love to talk to more people about, you know, the culture that we're creating around uh, Northwest Travel Messenger and the processes that we use and the work that we do um, in our peer-focused work. But, you know, other than that, I guess those are the only three things that I could think of, right? Open for suggestions, we'd love to partner. Um, we've dropped the emails in the chat. Um, just encourage you guys to reach out to us. Um, Jason, um, you will have a, a PDF version of your slides for me to be able to share with everybody who registered. Yes, so we will share a PDF version and we would love to come back and do a more broad presentation, right, around some of the work that we're doing. Now, this is strategically focused on one of the aspects of the work in the way that we deliver services. But we would love to be able to talk more about what we're doing overall, the programs that we're leading in different communities, training opportunities, partnership opportunities, um, capacity building opportunities. So um, I wanna drop that one off on you, Amanda. At some point in the future, maybe January, would it be okay if we came back and developed a different presentation? I'll tell and you what, January's taken, but you can come in February. February. Yeah. <laughs> Which is that a great us, month. Yes. That gives us enough time for people who have participated. I hope that's not subliminal timing. <laughs> Oh, no, I just already have January scheduled out. <laughs> I promise. Um, oh, I, didn't, you have I a didn't great smile. 
<laughs> but that gives people time to give feedback and say, hey, these are the, some of the things that we'd love to learn more about the model. I think that's perfect. And I would be more than happy if you have a survey or, you know, just a quick anything you'd like, we can link it into the peer to peer newsletter and make yep. sure everybody has an opportunity to take that survey before February. So um, you have a really good uh, idea on what our listeners are wanting to get from you. If that's okay, please. Yep, that is perfectly fine. Wonderful. Well, I will get that out to you. Um, I want to say thank you one more time to Northwest Credible Messenger, Jason and Kalia. Um, we've had the opportunity and the great honor of working with you since about, gosh, I want to say March or April. And it's just been really fantastic. Um, it's constantly learning, stretching and growing. And I'm really looking forward to your next peer blend with us. And um, if you have any information that you would like for us to maybe tuck into the newsletter, please let us know. So we will be at the Peers in Power Peer Conference. So Yay. tune in, that's right around the corner. Amy, why don't you throw that into the chat one more time, um, the, the link. So anybody who wants to um, attend has the ability. That is a virtual conference and it is on a Saturday. So you probably, probably won't have to take time off of work unless you're a weekend worker. And if that's the case, I'm sure we'll find a way to um to figure something out because we want to make sure everybody has access as much as possible. So we have two minutes left. Any last minute questions, concerns? Does anybody want to do a dance? We can do the hokey pokey. All right. <laughs> hey, we did All that right, at the you. training this week. <laughs> we should, because according to Jeopardy, that is what it's all about. Oh, Ooh, yeah. oh Lamont, <laughs> it's it's that was wonderful. I, I cannot wait to shake your hand over that one. <laughs> that was great. It, it was one of my favorite Jeopardy questions. Alex Trebek threw it out there. It was a question <laughs> on um, Potpourri. He said, according to millions, this is what it's all about. And the answer was the hokey pokey. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, Lamont, you understand the power of language. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, folks. Um, we appreciate you very much. And um, please feel free to reach out to me, Jason Kalia, or Shelly Shore, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, or you think that you would like to be uh, Shelly Shore and I, not Jason and Kalia, um, to be part of the Peer Blend moving forward into 2023. Thanks, folks. Please take care. And we will hopefully see you next month for Peer uh, Jeopardy, actually. Funny that you mentioned that, Lamont. So it will be recovery and peer uh, Jeopardy time, and we will have a lot of fun, and it will be good stuff for next month. Bye, everyone.